Okay, so let's move on to uh, our representatives from uh, the Supreme Court boards who are here today. We've got a, a couple who have got uh, presentations they want to make, and then I was going to check and see if any of the other folks who uh, that are here today wanted to share some thoughts too. Uh, we have uh, Michael Cherry here from the Practice of Law Board. We have uh, Sarah is it OV, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. From the uh, LLT board, we have Emily Rose Mowry from the Law Clerk Program Board. We have Jennifer Taylor from the Character and Fitness Board and Todd Albert Stone from the MCLE Board. I was gonna start with um, Chair Michael Cherry from the Practice of Law Board. Uh, thank you, uh, President Tollison and Executive Director uh, Nemet. Um, Rex has some slides. I think if he can share them, um, that would be great. I'm hoping Rex got them. So uh, to start, uh, let me say that the Practice of the Law Board has no position today on the structure of the bar. Rather, we're here today to listen and learn and be open to the ideas that are discussed so that later as a board, we can uh, talk about them and, and give you our, our best consideration. Uh, next slide, please, Rex. I, I want to start out by, I know that sometimes people think that the practice of law board is the rideshare disruptors against the taxi cab. But I want to assure you that both with taxi cab and ethos, um, the, the board's goal is to gather data, analyze it, and then uh, work towards solutions. So, you know, there's a bit of a jest here, but uh, I, I do think that what's happening with taxi cab is a very positive, uh, positive dialogue. On the next slide, please, Rex. For those who don't know, this is the Practice of Law Board who we work with. We are a board. We see ourselves as a board of the Supreme Court. We take uh, complaints about the unlawful or unauthorized practice of law. And when appropriate, we refer them either to the Washington Attorney General's office or to the county prosecutor in the county where the unlawful practice may have occurred. And we also refer to other bar associations. For example, this year, we referred an unlawful uh, practice of law complaint to a tribal court. We have liaisons with the Access to Justice Board and the Access to Justice Technology Committee. We work, uh, have a member with the Equity and Disparity Group of the Washington State Bar Association. And of course, as we know, we're here today to discuss, we get our administrative support from the Washington State Bar Association. Uh, we presented this slide to the Supreme Court the last two years in our annual meeting with the court and had good reception from the court. And just this week, one of my um, board members, who you'll hear from in a bit, uh, representing another board, pointed out to me, Michael, you left the public off of this, who do we work with? And I do see, and the board sees, that the Practice of Law Board is representative of the public. We work on the public's behalf to educate, to innovate, and, and to coordinate. So what guides our work? On the next slide, please, Rex. Well, the big one is GR 25, which defines the practice of law board. But we also work with uh, the statute RCW 2.48.182, which defines the unlawful practice of law as a statute in Washington and makes it a misdemeanor for the first offense. RCW 248.180 uh, does not define the practice of law. Instead, it points to GR 24, which defines the practice of law. And so our innovation function is really is guided by GR 25, which tells us we're to create new means of legal services for the practice of law. And that touches on practice of law GR 24. Our coordinate role of referring UPL complaints to the appropriate authority is kind of there at the intersection of the RCW GR 24 and GR 25. And again, as we all know, we're talking about it today, GR 12.3, the administration of the Supreme Court boards. What we did and what we hope the board hopes will drive some of the conversation today, and we're kind of getting into uh, where Julie uh, Shanklin, uh, General Counsel Shanklin is going to discuss, 
Um, we have been looking at our activities and using the uh, McDonald Keller analysis, which is in the uh, uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, or excuse me, the uh, Fifth Circuit um, about the Texas uh, bar and um, the uh, Access to Justice Committee in Texas. And so on the next slide, Rex, what we did uh, is we just listed what that ruling, McDonald Keller analysis, lists as germane activities to regulate the legal profession, improve the quality of legal services, the functioning of the state's courts, jurisdiction procedure and practice of federal courts or tribunals, the functioning of the legal system writ large, and the laws governing the activities. Uh, Quay, lawyers, I had to look that up. I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but it means lawyers acting in the capacity of lawyers. So our three roles, educate, innovate, and coordinate. What we tried to provide you in this matrix is really where we think our activities are germane to uh, bar associations and organizations. And where, as I interpret McDonald and Keller, and I may be interpreting incorrectly, we would be appropriate for us to be taking these activities. And so for the practice of law board activities, I think that the majority of the work that we do is quite germane to what uh, the court seems to be looking for as the appropriate activities of a board and a bar association in conjunction to work with. So that's the last slide. Uh, thank you, Rex, for accommodating me and, 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 and uh, making it so I didn't have to fumble with how PowerPoint interacts with Zoom. Um, and I'll just see if there's any questions before I, I cede the floor to the other boards who are here. Seeing none, I'll thank you, uh, President Tollefson, and we can go to the next person okay, on the agenda. Okay, thank you, Chair Michael Sherry. Uh, we have Sarah Bovey. Am I pronouncing that correctly, by the way? It's Bovey, thanks. Bovey, sorry. Um, you are next. Great. Um, so as Michael mentioned, I'm in my first year in the practice of law board, and I'm in the last year of my second term on the limited license legal technician board. Um, I'm not the chair or chair is unavailable today. Um, so I'm just going to give you a, some brief information about what it is that our board does. I know um, uh, Hinata went over um, quite a few of our tasks this morning, but just as a reminder, um, we help with the education piece. So when uh, Triple T sits for a licensing exam, we help with the examinations. Um, our rule also requires certain mandatory continuing legal education. So when there is a change to the law, which there has been in the past, um, the Triple T board puts together um, additional information and requires legal technicians to take special education um, to bring them up to speed with those changes. Um, that, and I know you may be aware that there was a recent order um, sunsetting um, the limited license legal technician um, uh, pathway, um, but that uh, order does not change uh, the Triple LT board's function A through O. Um, that's our purpose, that's our formation, and much of the activities that we that we will do. So we, a lot of the activities we'll continue to do um, have to do with this regulatory function, such as um, that mandatory continuing legal education um, and disciplinary functions. Um, just as a reminder, the, the Triple LT board was formulated in 2019 when um, APR 28 was adopted and then was effective. Um, and the rule was adopted out of recognition that there are not, there is tremendous unmet need in our state for qualified legal professionals. Um, and that is that is what our purpose is, is, to, is, is a delivery on some of the work of the practice of law board, um, which made the recommendation that, that we need to have other avenues for folks to get legal services beside the traditional attorney model. Um, I can take any additional questions about our function, um, some of our roles. Um, I think Michael's um, picture that he has, that Venn diagram, when it shows what our role is versus what WISDA's role is, um, is, is applicable, applicable to us too. It's just APR 28 is, is our rule um, and, and we're administered by the bar. And there's not a tremendous, a lot of, a lot, tremendous amount of overlap. Um, we answer to the Supreme Court, we're appointed by the Supreme Court, and, and our role we see is really um, directed um, towards what it is that the Supreme Court wishes us to do. Um, 
and not a lot of interaction um, with the Board of Governors other than to have a, a conversation um, and to um, keep them informed of our activities. Sorry, any questions for um, a representative from the uh, Triple LT board, Sarah Beauvais? Looks like past President Shaketi is raising his hand. Yeah, just quickly, um, I know the practice of law board <clears throat> set um, at, at its at his start of his presentation said they were taking no position and we're here to learn and listen. Um, is the Triple LT board have that same perspective now, or do you have a position on uh, bifurcation or um, maintaining a mandatory integrated bar? I think there's some really good work going on with the taxi cab right now. Um, the Triple LT board does not have a position on those things. I'm letting you know how the Triple LT board has viewed our rule. We have a rule APR 28. We have um, uh, uh, duties that we need to, to complete. Um, and I think the Triple LT board is in a position of uh, allowing that taxi cab organization to work through those processes to help define what does administer mean exactly um, and allowing that to help define um, what that position should be um, and, and how it should move forward. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for our representative from the Triple LT board? No? Okay, we have um, three other representatives here today. Uh, um, and I don't know if any one of them had anything they wanted to share or add to these comments from uh, Sarah Beauvais and uh, Michael Cherry with respect to their, uh, their boards. I'll just kind of, no, nothing from Mr. Alperstone. I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in and speak briefly about the MCLE board. I will say um, that we uh, gave what I think is a fairly comprehensive presentation to the Board of Governors a few months ago. So anyone who was in attendance for that, I, I doubt that I have anything, I'm sure that I don't have anything significant to add to that. But for those who are not familiar, um, what the MCLE board does is we accredit courses, first and foremost, um, and consider MCLE policies. We determine and adjust fees. We consider, and this is sort of the bread and butter of the private meetings, um, the, the non-public portion of our meetings. We consider member and sponsor petitions for waivers and appeals from staff decisions. Um, and then publicly, we suggest Rule 11 amendments. Um, and I hope are familiar that we, after a consent work, um, achieved a revision to Rule 11 that requires um, once every three years, one hour of MCLE credit for um, on the subject of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, a considerable amount of our work on the petition side of it um, is interpreting and applying that rule in the gray areas of what should and should not constitute um, uh, what, what fits or does not fit the Rule 11 revision. And then beyond that, we do consider other and are considering other potential um, revisions to Rule 11 and suggestions to uh, the Supreme Court on ways to improve um, uh, MCLE uh, administration. And of course, um, one of our members, Robert Millay, participates actively in taxi cab uh, and although he's not here with us today, he's the best person to speak on that on that subject and whatever we might have to say about it, although we are all excited about the progress that's been made. So beyond that, I'm happy to take questions about the MCLE board, but I'm not sure that I have any strong opinions um, that represent the board, uh, the MCLE board as a whole. Anybody have any questions for uh, Mr. Alberstone? Um, Jennifer Taylor, did you want to say anything on behalf of the Character and Fitness Board? Uh, good afternoon, President Collison, and hi, uh, hello to the members of the Board of Governors. Um, my name is Jennifer Taylor. I am the Vice Chair of the Character and Fitness Board. Michael Morgus is our chair and was able to be here today. Um, just very briefly, um, Character and Fitness Board is one that probably most 
most of our members have no, no familiarity with. What will happen is if there is um, an applicant for admission to the bar that uh, bar council has determined, there may be a potential issue with their um, the good moral character and fitness to practice law. Um, those applicants are referred to uh, the character and fitness board for a hearing. Um, and we conduct that hearing looking at um, all of the essential elements, uh, eligibility requirements under APR 20. Uh, the board uh, conducts the hearing, uh, uh, there's testimony. Uh, we go through voluminous records that are provided by the applicant because the applicant has the burden of establishing that they do um, by clear and convincing evidence that they do meet the uh, essential eligibility, re eligibility requirements. Um, and then we simply make a recommendation to the Supreme Court uh, on whether the individual should be admitted to the bar or not. Um, and that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, I can tell you I am on my, uh, in my second year um, on the board. Um, and I'm very humbled and impressed by how seriously all of the board members take um, the mission. Um, and it, it's been very gratifying personally uh, to be involved with that board and I'm happy to take any questions if any board, uh, anybody has any, but thank you for the opportunity just to appear briefly today on behalf of the CFB. Thank you. Um, any questions for uh, our representative from the uh, Character and Fitness Board? Not seeing any hands, any hands in the room? Nope. Okay, uh, so we have one last representative here today and I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance if I mispronounce the name. Oh, there's a question? Oh, Governor Adwale has got your hand up. Not really a question. I thought you wanted me to speak on the Access to Justice Board. I, we just presented uh, in January to the Board of Governors, so I didn't really have any much presentation other than to take any questions that you guys may have for me or for the board. Thank you, Governor Adwale. Does anybody have any questions uh, about the Access to Justice Board? I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so we have another representative here today. Like I said, I'm going to uh, apologize in advance if I don't pronounce the the last name correctly, but it's Emily Rose. Is it Maori or Maori? It's Maori, but you can just call me Emily. Hey. Okay. Um, anything you'd like to add to what's already been said? Yeah, just, I guess just briefly, I am imagining that everyone here is familiar with the APR six law clerk program, but I will just say a thing or two since I'm here. Uh, I am Emily. I am the current chair of the law clerk board and I've served on the board for the last five years. I think I'm about to end my second term. I'm also a graduate of the APR6 program. I would not be an attorney without this program. Um, so I am a firm advocate for it. And I know that the BOG in general is very supportive and we appreciate that. Um, I don't know that I speak for the entire board on this because I didn't really run it by them. But um, as far as the setting of this meeting is concerned, I don't know who would administer the APR6 program if the bar didn't take a role in that. And so I do think it's an important part of the bar association. Uh, I also happen to know, because I've checked the budget, that it's a cash flowing part of the bar association, which is rare in our budget. So I think consistently in the whole time I've been involved, which is 10 plus years now, the bar association makes money off of the law clerk program because we do pay tuition, although it's much less than traditional law school. And I also think just speaking to access to justice and some of my other fellow board chairs that our program provides a path to being an attorney that you can't get a lot of places. Not every state has something like the clerk program, though we are by no means the only state that does. And offering a path to being an attorney for folks that can't afford to pay $200,000 for law school or move to Seattle or Spokane is really important. And I would love to see the Bar Association continue to do that for people in Washington State. I think it's really important and it should move forward. I also would love to see the Bar Association expand its advocacy of this kind of alternative way to become an attorney. Um, I know that 
my experience has been that my fellow law clerk graduates end up taking the burden on of trying to get reciprocity if they go to another state that isn't Washington. And it would be really nice to have some additional advocacy and the strength of the bar behind us when we're looking to potentially practice law in another state because not everyone stays in Washington their whole career. And it has, it has been a thing. There are people who have been able to change their licensure to another state having graduated from APR 6, but uh, it tends to be the individual applicant that has to take the burden on of doing that appeal and making that happen because most states say that you have to have graduated from an ABA approved law school to be admitted and the APR 6 program is not ABA approved, it's WSBA approved. But I personally am a huge advocate for the program. I would not be an attorney without this program. And I don't see any way that we can keep doing it without WSBA. So thanks for supporting us. Anybody? Oh, it looks like uh, Governor Bell, do you have a question for the, uh, for uh, Emily Rose Mowry? Or Emily? I do. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Mowry, thank you so much for your service on the law clerk board. Um, I'm a big supporter of the board and the program. It's something that's unique to our profession, something for us to be proud of. So thank you for that. I do have a question for you. Um, you know, obviously right now the board operates under the WISBA, which operates under the delegated authority from the Supreme Court. I'm wondering if you could tell me what you would anticipate would be the effect on the law clerk board if it was just essentially put directly under the Supreme Court. In other words, the Supreme Court owned it more or less directly. Would that, how would that impact the program? And I realize that this is a bit of a difficult situation to sort of envision. That's a hypothetical, but that would seem to be the apparently readily alternative to the current existing integrated bar would be that a board like yours would just exist under the Supreme Court. How would that impact the program? If you can maybe just talk to me for a minute about that. Thank you. I will wildly speculate for you uh, because I haven't really considered that before, but I will say that we do utilize shared resources from WISBA. And so we have a staff member that helps administer the program along with some of the other programs. We don't have a full staff member just for our program, but um, we do get a lot of help in administering from a WSBA staff member. And I don't know that we'd have that same help that's really essential to what we do uh, without that. Like the Supreme Court's not going to give us a law clerk for that, you know? So we really need WSBA resources for that reason. And the only other administrative people in the clerk program are volunteer attorneys like me who are on the board. So it's a bunch of volunteers and then like one WSBA part-time staff member. And also the Supreme Court's real busy. And I'm imagining that if we had to go to them directly for everything, it would probably slow things down and make it harder to do what we do. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, yes, uh, Michael Cherry, question. Um, thank you, President Tolson. And to uh, maybe address Governor uh, Abel's question a little bit, um, the Practice of Law Board is in a position right now where we're somewhat recommending the creation of the seventh board. And in our meeting with the Supreme Court on uh, Wednesday, um, we discussed with the court whether or not that board should report to the administrative office of the court. And this is something that the practice of law board has looked into. It seems that if we are talking about uh, maybe things transfer to the court directly, as opposed to being uh, part of WISBA, we're really talking about them becoming a part of the administrative office of the court. And that is a group that works very, very hard to keep the courts running. And that is their focus. And they are, like many organizations, probably they would tell you they are understaffed. I don't mean to speak. I didn't mean to speak at our meeting on behalf of uh, Don Marie Rubio from the administrative office of the court. But um, there would be a tremendous lack of transfer of institutional knowledge should the boards be moved to the court. Um, this could be devastating to boards functioning. Um, and I, I think we need to be very, very cautious. And I, I, I apologize to uh, President Tollison and to Executive Director Nevitt. I know that the agendas are in place, uh, but at some point we should have the Administrative Office of the Court at one of these meetings to speak to what they do. 
uh, so that we all understand it. Uh, and it is a very, Washington courts are an extremely complex, um, it, it's a platypus, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, got a, it's got the body of a mammal and a duck bill stuck on it. And um, this makes things very difficult. So, but that's a piece of data we need to look at. And we need to hear it from the administrative office of the court rather than us presupposing what their functionality and, and abilities and, and, and uh, 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 both for a budget and expertise perspective would be in, in taking on boards. Thank you. Um. Chief Disciplinary Officer, or Chief Regulatory Officer, excuse me, uh, Hanada Garcia has her hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just wanted to um, mention that perhaps receiving administrative support from the same organization and staff allows for collaboration between boards and an ongoing example uh, right now is the MCLE board and the law clerk board are working together on a joint proposal to make some, propose some changes to APR 11 that would allow uh, tutors, folks who are committing, you know, an extensive amount of time to teaching and supervising law clerks to be eligible for MCLE credit. Um, so I just wanted to point it out that uh, perhaps having the same group of staff or being in the same organization kind of facilitates some collaboration. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Beauvais, Triple LT Board. I just want to echo that, that there is a tremendous amount of liaison work that has happened on the Triple LT board. Um, the Access to Justice board has come to our meetings. We've sat on the Access to Justice board meetings on different issues. And I kind of want to touch a little bit on some of what the section comments were earlier in this meeting, and that the Washington State Bar Organization is the only statewide bar organization, and it makes it very difficult to keep things consistent and to touch each part of our state if we're not working um, or at least communicating from that section. And to be able to have the interactions and have the conversations, even when they're difficult conversations, um, even when we have a place where we're not in the same place, um, but to be able to to have a, a single organization in which to have those difficult conversations, I think can keep things consistent um, for the folks in Washington across the state. I think that's, that's an important piece. Jennifer Taylor, do you have your hand up? Well, thank you. I just wanted to piggyback on this and, and uh, put in a plug for um, the, the support Support that uh, the Character and Fitness Board gets from the Bar Association is phenomenal. And we really could not do what our role is without that support. Um, bar Council, who re uh, is representing uh, uh, the regulatory service side, they are always very professional. We are also provided our own legal advisor um, who, and they, they're able to maintain that independence from each other. But I just want to give a plug for the services. Um, I mean, they do an incredible job. We could not do what we're supposed to do without um, the counsel that we're provided. I can assure you from personal experience that um, our support council does the, the bulk of the drafting before they turn it over to the, um, the person that's going to be writing the opinion of the recommendation to the Supreme Court. Um, I, I do, I'm not making any, um, taking any sides on this, this debate on what's going on. I think this is meaningful work and there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. But from a personal standpoint, I do think that um, uh, WISBA provides uh, an enormous service um, through the Character and Fitness Board. And I, I think it's important that they continue to do that. Um, so thank you. That was just an off the cuff remark and hopefully I'm just speaking for myself <laughs> uh, in this uh, circumstance, but thank you for um, letting me jump on and, and say thank that. You. Thank you, Governor Stevens. Yes, Mr. President, um, Governor Clark, um, President-elect Clark had placed something uh, in the chat and I wanted to either read it or have you read it before it gets too far down the road. Oh, yes, I see it here. You want me to read it or do you, or do you want to read it? Yeah, no, go ahead. That's all right, Mr. President. Okay, I'll read it. This is from uh, President-elect Dan Clark. Oh, it's trying to go away. Don't go away. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, if, well, I got it now. Uh, this is from President-elect Dan Clark. Um, he says, one of the goals I would really like to see the BOG tackle in the future is to look to at least the Northwest bars, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Utah, and looking to try to establish better reciprocity for Washington State Bar Association members, and especially to have them accept our APR Rule 6 graduate WSBA members have the ability to automatically become members in these neighboring states. I'd like to have the Board of Governors really reach out to these other states and urge them to adopt mirror APR six programs in their states. It's an absolutely great program and one that I wholeheartedly support. Um, and I will tell you that uh, I, I went to law school and other members of my family went to law school, but I'm pretty sure that my first boss after law school uh, while he went to law school for one year, he then uh, read the law with his father, who was a who was a judge down in uh, Thurston Mason County Superior Courts. Uh, my first boss was Charles T. Wright on the Washington State Supreme Court, who for while I worked for him, he was the chief justice. And uh, so thanks to the uh, being able to read the law, <laughs> that was my first job was with him. So, OK. We have some more hands up. Uh, Governor Stevens, did you have another comment you wanted to make? No, okay. Uh, Mr. Alberstone from the MCLE board is here. I was just gonna say, um, if it wasn't clear from my earlier remarks, um, it, it would be absolutely impossible for us to do, well, for the MCLE board to do what they do without the support of WISBA staff. Um, and in particularly, in particular, um, considering um, petitions from both um, uh, attorneys and professionals and from sponsors it would be impossible if we didn't have Adeline Shea and the others who work um, to support us. So, okay. Any other comments? Anybody else have their hands up? I don't see any. Um, uh, um, um, oh, there Mr. is somebody President, else. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't raise my hand. I'm sorry. Well, you're, uh, ra you're raising your voice, so go ahead. I'm <laughs> I just wanted to, I don't want us to just talk about this and just forget about it because it's an important issue that I think we need to explore. And that is the question raised by the president-elect Dan Clark with regards to APR Rule 6 um, L um, uh, eligibility in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Utah. I think we need to explore that. And I don't know if we can ask the ED to help us look into this and uh, probably have, may have a plan for discussion for to bring it up with the EDs in all these other states and see the possibility. We need to explore this further. Even if it's gonna be no, let's find out first. Um, Executive Director Nevitt. Did you want to say something? Yeah, well, I wanted to let folks know that this is something that we have been looking at and, and Chief Garcia has been looking at it. I think in part, we were wondering if Oregon was going to adopt a similar program and then we had planned to get into conversations with them about reciprocity. I don't think we've looked into the issue of whether we could somehow become like an ABA accredited law school. I don't know if uh, Chief Garcia has information about that or not, but I do know that we are one of very, very few states that have a program like this. Um, so it's definitely a topic of conversation and something that um, Chief Garcia has been assigned to look at with all her extra time, um, but we could certainly make a report back at a future board meeting where we're at with things. There are four states that allow you to become an attorney without going to an ADA law school. Just four. Oh. I've um, had several conversations with the Oregon State Bar um, about this very topic and brought it up a few times. And each time I bring it up, they are interested in, in talking with us about it. Because uh, as Executive Director Nevitt mentions, they have their own program that uh, they've been looking into. Um, we may also have an opportunity at Western States to talk to our 
uh, folks in Idaho, Montana, Oregon um, about this very issue and see maybe what we can do there too to spark any kind of interest. Okay, anybody else have any thoughts, comments, or ideas about these different boards that have been here today to talk to us? <clears throat> 